Hello, I'm Grace Morrell Burnett, M&A Legal Analyst at Bloomberg Law. Today we have with us Andy Nussbaum of Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen and Katz. He is a partner in the firm's corporate department where his practice involves a wide range of mergers and acquisitions matters, including cross-border transactions, takeovers, spin-offs, divestitures, private equity transactions, and joint ventures. He also handles related work in public offerings, financings, and corporate governance. Andy, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss private equity deal trends. Happy to be here. Thank you. First, I'd like to open the discussion by mentioning that private equity deal making is breaking records this year. The dollar volume of private equity buyouts announced in July was the highest monthly volume seen since the summer of 2007. And the volume of private equity investments, including venture capital rounds year to date, has already su surpassed any year on record. There is an impressive amount of deal activity happening. Andy, your firm has advised on several large private equity transactions this year, including the largest deal involving a private equity party announced so far in 2021, the pending $34 billion buyout of Medline Industries, Inc. by a private equity consortium, including several of the biggest names in private equity. This deal will also be one of the largest leveraged buyouts ever to take place. You have noted that it seems like private equity's reluctance to do these very large deals has disappeared recently. Can you tell us about the market dynamics you're seeing drive this trend? And aside from the mega deals, just regarding the general record-breaking levels of private equity deal activity we're seeing, can you offer your insights as to what forces are driving this? Sure. So I, I think it's been... Um written about many times, including in your in your publications, just the massive amount of capital that continues to flow into PE sponsors of every shape and size and every type of investment vertical, industry, uh, opportunistic investing, uh, more patient capital that's uh, willing to be committed for you know more than five years, for example, even more than 10 years sometimes. And then um, on the other end, in the venture side, as you said, just incredible uh, volume. I, you know, one of the one of the real, um, you know, propellants to the market uh, has been the continued um, robustness of the financing market, um, where not just the uh, typical uh, lending banks that we're all used to seeing in PE deals, but also, you know, all sorts of new uh, third-party lenders, direct lenders, PE firms becoming lenders. Uh, being willing to add leverage, you know, in a way that you know we really haven't seen uh, even I think uh, since the since the Great Recession, um, uh, and and very rarely even before then. So you have a combination of a lot of capital available on the PE equity side, uh, massive and a very diverse a range of products available on the finance on the debt financing side, um, and then the only limit I suppose on PE transacting is whether people can reach, you know, terms on price. And of course, um, leverage helps uh, make those price discussions potentially uh, easier and closer to connect. But the reality is, uh, as your data shows, the, the pace is just uh, astonishing. PE is going wherever the water will let it flow. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, where is PE most active? I mean, again, uh, and again, your data shows that it's not just as buyers and sellers, it's as lenders, it's as minority investors, um, it's as a pipe, a, a pipe equity sponsor, uh, the convertible market is very robust, and you really can't, uh, I mean, all these have contributed to just a massive amount of activity on the PE side in the M&A market. Thank you, Andy. In terms of trends in deal structures and deal terms in these uh, private equity m a transactions what are you, you seeing in your practice and are there any new or emerging trends associated with this boom or the pandemic that you're seeing you know it's interesting in a way grace i feel like the pandemic um on some level didn't really interrupt what were already trends you know in the private equity m a market and, and most prominently um, you know, the ability to get a clean break, a clean break exit uh, as a seller, a PE seller, 
and uh, PE buyers on the buy side willing to take you know uh, the risk of a clean break purchase uh, often with the support of, of reps and warranty insurance um, and sometimes even without indemnities around you know fundamental representations relating to capitalization and uh, corporate authority um, really the trend in, of PE deals both on the buy side and the sell side to look more and more like a public company uh, M&A transaction. And I don't, I don't think the pandemic uh, has really disrupted that. If anything, I think it may have accelerated it because, you know, the, the desire of PE to be transacting uh, has not reduced. And uh, sellers at the same time have become more reluctant to take uh, incremental transaction risk uh, and uh, the deals that got renegotiated or, or that uh, got terminated in the context of the pandemic, um, I think, you know, reminded sellers that, you know, the boilerplate, um, the, boiler, the boilerplate never matters until it does. Um, and I have to say, all in all, I think we were uh, generally very interested to see that, you know, the basic, you know, architecture of PE deals that has been evolving for many years, but in a gradual way, really worked pretty well in in the vast majority of of deals that were you know midway between signing and closing uh during the pandemic there were relatively few terminated transactions there really were no new developments in delaware law relating to material adverse effect i mean there were a few cases where it was found but the the law was generally on the same continuum there were a few renegotiated deals but all in all you know the m a PE deal uh, playbook, I think, held together, um, you know, surprisingly, uh, su surprisingly well. Um, there were clearly some additional innovations that came into the market due to the pandemic. Um, uh, carve outs, not just from the MAE for pandemic related events, but um, some sellers learning the hard way that you also needed to adjust uh, your interim operating covenant provisions. Uh, to take into account the possibility that you were going to have to take radical steps uh, to address and non-ordinary steps to address you know, the impact of the pandemic on your business. Right. And aside from deal terms addressing the pandemic, are you seeing the pandemic hindering certain aspects of the deal process? Even if you know the deal makes it through, um, are, yeah. there, are there parts of the process that are just a lot more challenging? Yeah, so I, I'm maybe going to ask that in two ways. I'm going to identify, I think, a few things where the process has become more challenging and maybe a few ways in which the process in an odd way became uh, more efficient. Um, people worried a lot about being able to do diligence uh, in the way that PE buyers do diligence, uh, operating totally remotely, both remotely vis-a-vis -vis you and the potential seller, but also even within you know, the private equity deal team that's you know, used to spending late nights in a conference room, you know, uh, or all night in a conference room, sorting through, you know, issues in a deal and the business diligence uh, in particular. I do think that aspect of 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 the PEMA process really went incredibly smoothly. Um, I think that it no doubt required um, probably more time on the part of sellers to well populate data rooms and to coordinate you know, calls to respond to questions. But all in all, I think the diligence went incredibly smoothly. The one bump in the road, I would say, is PE buyers, as a general matter, like to, you know, there's that look and feel uh, of the management team and of the business. And, and that obviously couldn't happen. You, you couldn't sit down, you know, with the senior team and or have dinner with them and just watch them and listen to them and, you know, get to know them and see what sort of, you know, partnership uh, could be developed there. And then, of course, things like uh, site visits uh, to factories um, either became, you know, uh, not doable for legal reasons or, or, or not sensible because the factory wasn't really operating uh, uh, much. I will say on the negotiating side, I, I was pleasantly surprised that, that deals could get done as smoothly as I think they did get done in terms of the negotiating process. And I, I credit, you know, my colleagues across, you know, our, 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 uh, our other law firms in this country and for that matter around the world, where I do think that lawyers and bankers and other advisors tried pretty hard to 
you know, not waste time. Uh, everybody was exhausted. Everybody was stressed. The volume was astonishing. Uh, and I think people kind of realize that a lot of the things that we might argue about if we're sitting in a room or on a conference call that, you know, we can always end and start again tomorrow, whatever, that a lot of that just kind of went out the window and people um, just decided to focus more on the issues that really were material to their client uh, and the business challenges, you know, that 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 needed to be solved. And what I thought was a very collegial and kind of at least from uh, the law profession's point of view, a, a nice commentary on the ability of lawyers to to work together to achieve, you know, the goals of, of their clients. Um, that leads me to my next question. Uh, just before we move on to talking about exits, I wanted to ask how your firm is handling this this high level of deal activities these days. Wachtell year to date is among the top three M&A firms ranked by global market share. So how are you managing the boom? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, we are very fortunate in that we have uh, wonderful clients and we have uh, astonishing associates uh, and colleagues, both uh, at the professional level and also uh, legal level, but also our staff. And I think people really, it was a sort of all for one, one for all mentality we've been sharing. And when you know one colleague has a childcare issue or, or, or goodness forbid, a, a health issue in their family, other people, you know, just being totally willing to to jump in and cover the gap, and clients being understanding when when people needed to needed to be away for whatever reason, and uh, I, I just think you know this is an environment in which you know put aside the you need the infrastructure, you need the technology to be able to function. That you know it really goes just to the heart of the culture of a firm as to whether people really are uh, in this together. And and I we were just you know really a very very um, impressed by how hard uh, we each work to, you know, to support each other uh, and our clients, you know, willingness to, um, you know, work with us when we had those moments of, of, of disruption. That's, that's great. Um, so glad to hear that. Uh, moving on to exit strategies, I'm curious about how private equity parties are viewing the various exit options that they have, aside from the SPAC option being added to the list recently, which we'll get into a little more in a bit. Are there any unique trends um, in the exit strategies that you've observed uh, private equity investors choosing these days? Yeah, so I, I think that, um, I'm not sure it's unique, but I would say that um, we are seeing more and more of the, um, you know, Swedish uh, smorgasbord sort of approach to exits in that uh, PE firms really want to pursue every every possible avenue. You know, the, the market is so robust and whether it's uh, selling to a PE, another PE firm, or it's uh, taking on a you know, a minority investment in the business to get out some value now, but retain, you know, the bulk of the company or the IPO markets, particularly, you know, which obviously open and shut with, you know, quite, quite rapid with limited notice and at a quite rapid pace being ready to do an IPO so that when the window is open, you might well go that route. And I'm thinking back to a deal we did last July representing a strategic buyer uh, acquiring a, a, a business uh, from a, a group of PE firms for a few billion dollars. And that in that case, the, the sellers were looking at everything. They were looking at SPACs, they were ready to do an IPO, they were looking at strategics, and they were looking at selling to other PE firms. And the truth was, week to week, it wasn't clear who had the best shot you know, at, at getting the business. And I just think that's the nature of the M&A market where we exist in, which is it, it changes rapidly. Uh, PE firms are n as nimble as they come in you know, recognizing opportunity. Uh, and as much as people say, oh, they just want to get out, uh, you know, yes, but the but being they want to get out at the right time at the right price. Right. We only have a few more minutes left here, and there's a lot to be said about SPACs, but I'll just ask ask you this. Um, are, are private equity parties now viewing the SPAC exit option favor favorably? So, you know, I think that they view it as they always have, which is they're not sure it's the best idea, but they're also not sure it's not the right idea. And so we, we do very often see uh, PE firms poking around at SPACs when they, when they are exiting. I do think it, it's always kind of interesting to see 
one financial player be suspicious of another financial player in the market. But I, I do think that uh, PE sellers tend to recognize the challenges of a SPAC deal in the same way they recognize the potential challenges of a of an IPO listing, which is isn't a full exit and and is subject to market volatility in a way that SPACs are not always. And likewise, the risks of selling to a sponsor where you may have regulatory issues. But I think SPACs are still very much on the table. Great. And looking to the future, Andy, do you think this level of private equity deal activity can be sustained? Do you see it slowing down anytime soon? And looking at the legal and regulatory landscape, do you see any challenges ahead that that could potentially slow this all down? Right. So I've um, I've been wrong on this, you know, pretty much uh, every time I've been asked about what's going to happen next, which is I for years have been saying this volume is just not sustainable. I mean, I continue to believe that. Uh, but the data would tell you otherwise. Uh, and even looking at recent announcements in the last couple of weeks, several $5 billion plus PE transactions you know, out there, I'm sure that means there are others uh, uh, underway. Um, I think what could really hurt the market uh, would be um, you know, uh, a tightening of the finance market, a, a little less about rate because rates could go up and still be extremely uh, favorable historically more about maybe leverage and covenant uh, terms, if those terms were to start to tighten, uh, although I don't see that imminent. Um, I think the regulatory angle uh, will have an impact. It already has had an impact. Uh, it is an impact in particular for strategics, obviously, and that may limit the window of strategic buyers uh, that PE firms can look to when they're exiting, um, because while strategics may be willing to take a lot of the regulatory risk, at the end of the day, those those are terms you never want to have to trigger. You don't really want the break fee. You want the deal. Um, and I think the, so. The regulatory environment I think can have an impact. But you know, my final answer would be, you know, private equity has man. It's like water. Uh, it manages to find a way to flow. You know, if it, if one obstacle comes up in one area, the, you know, the river makes a bend and goes a, another direction, but reaches its destination. And I. I continue to be impressed by the the creativity and 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 pace with which PE firms, you know, evolve their their transaction uh, ideas. Andy, it's been a pleasure to get your insights today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.